I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. we're going to do this, and he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. I was you know, basically a, a complete failure up until the moment that I started making films. I started didn't know what I wanted to do. And I, I did believe what my parents taught me, that you should try to make the world a better place would be what I would like to do, but my attempts at doing so weren't successful. We were fighting against the Vietnam War. We thought that was very, very important. The war went on. Uh, we'd be out in the streets battling the cops. The cops beat me up. The attempts to try and improve our community weren't succeeding. Camera in hand, everything changed. And the camera is a license for me to go up to you and to invade every single part of your life. The camera is a license to invade people's personal space. I think a lot of your documentaries also show this aspect of kind of social justice. There's this undercurrent of let's relate to a lot of people who are fighting for a cause and then show in an extreme way what the ramifications are if we don't fight this condition. I don't know how you define patriotism, but I want to make this country better. And I'm not a good soldier, so I can't go and fight for the country. I'm not a politician. I can't go represent them in Congress. But I can be a good reporter, and I can point out the things, and I can make films about the things that I think need to be improved and need to be better. I'm not doing this because I don't like the country. I'm doing it because I love my country. And that's how I believe I can be the best patriot. It's like you're taking a personal story that's in some ways horrific and using it to tell a much broader maybe macroeconomic story or social story but you always you always take it down to the personal but also from the point of view of if anybody wants to make change this is a method for doing it tell a personal story that's an example of a, a broader change you'd like to see happen so i am so happy to have john alpert one of the most prolific and I don't know, excellent documentary makers of the past 50 years, I would say. Uh, John, welcome to the podcast. Welcome. It's nice seeing you again. The last time we saw each other was... 20 years ago almost. Wow. Like, I always say it was 1998. It seems like only yesterday. We were doing 3 a.m. We were going to go out into the city and film everyone we could find at 3 in the morning on like a Tuesday night. You, you were doing all the shooting and, uh, and then we had one guy doing audio, Duncan, and uh, we shot it for like, it feels like we shot it for like two years and then spent another year editing. Um, we worked a little faster than that, certainly a lot faster than the documentary that we're here to talk about today that took me 45 years to do. But we had, I think, three episodes in our 3 a.m. We had um, the the bus arriving from Rikers Island in in Queens with all the boyfriends and the girlfriends of the being released prisoners there yeah. waiting to meet them. That was a real crazy wow. scene. It was off the charts. 
We had Lower East Side, or East Village, uh, oh, Tompkins that's Square right. Park. Right, I forgot about that. We had that crazy stuff near Tompkins Square Park. We did the meatpacking district and the male prostitutes that were hanging around there by that uh, triangular shaped hotel. And then we did uh, old man's hockey at three o'clock in the morning because it was the only time my old foggy friends could afford to rent ice time. Three in the morning. Three in the morning. So, okay, before we finish that story. Okay, let's plug the new film. Yeah, okay. I just want to say we're here for Cuba and the Cameraman, a Netflix documentary that's just coming out that you, you did everything. I love the title of Cuba and the Cameraman because you're, I would say there's two signature aspects of your style that I've always liked. You, A, you put yourself in many of the documentaries. You're a character in a lot of your documentaries. But hidden, usually hidden behind the camera and sometimes you hear my voice and you certainly are aware that people are reacting to me, but I'm not, for want of a better word, I don't mean this in a pejorative way, I'm not Michael Mooring this. And, and they're very good at what they do. Uh, and actually, but this is the first documentary that I appear in. I, I didn't realize that I should be doing this until basically halfway through the production. So like uh, 25 years in, I realized that people were reacting to me and the trust that they were showing me in Cuba, trust that they were they would not normally ever give to anybody else, uh, was an important factor and sort of began weaving that into the film. I think also the trust Castro was giving you, he, Castro made you a character in your own documentary. He would call you the journalist and because probably scenes with Castro were so rare, you it's almost forced you to be a character. It almost brought that, that character alive, the character of you. Um, Fidel has a prominent role in this documentary uh, along with three other Cuban families and we follow them basically riding on the roller coaster of the Cuban Revolution for 45 years and spent uh, an extraordinary amount of personal time with Fidel. When you're, you're, your first time there and when we see, we see you as a, a young guy in like 1972 was the first time? Yeah, I was a kid. Yeah, and, you, you uh, look like a kid there. <laughs> looked like a kid, uh, had no experience, never made a documentary in my life, basically never been out of the country before uh, and get thrown into Cuba. Uh, it was the deep end of the pool. I'm not sure I did such a good job swimming, but that was the beginning of this film and also basically the beginning of my career as a filmmaker. And then you go, you, you go back over and over again, you build this relationship with these three families, you build a relationship with Castro, to the extent that when he flies to New York to, to speak in front of the, U the United Nations, you're like the only American on the plane with him uh, to, to, to film what was happening. And he speaks to you and he's, you know, joking around with you. Uh, and then you, 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 you follow through all the way, you know, 45 years. Right. I was basically at various times riding shotgun with Fidel and uh, we're, we're on a road trip. And um, he reacted to me as if you and I were on a road trip across America. And, um, you know, it was, I can't really say it was a buddy movie, but it was certainly uh, a movie in which he shared very, very personal things, both in terms of the storytelling and in terms of where he let the cameras. Fidel, where do you sleep? Uh, can I, hey, let, well, let's, let's take a look at your bedroom. Oh, and then he opens up his refrigerator. Like he was basically taking direction from you. He had the most important uh, international speech of his life to give it the United Nations. And I said, but Fidel, you know, let, let's talk a little bit. Let's, let's, let's walk and talk. And um, he, was, he was nice enough. Uh, his, his handlers, his security team was apoplectic. First of all, nobody had ever asked uh, to see these intimate things. Nobody had ever, I don't even know if anybody put a wireless microphone. When we put the wireless microphone on him, the, uh, the, the security team went crazy. They didn't know what that was. You know, there were already 100 attempts to kill Fidel, and here we are pinning something, some strange object on in, his chest. In the chest. middle of New York City, where, yeah. where everybody wanted to kill him. Yeah, yeah. Another aspect of your style is you ask these like crazy questions that, that don't really seem crazy on the surface, like, oh, what's in your refrigerator? But it leads to these uh, moments that are actually, when you think about it, pretty insane. Like Fidel Castro opening his refrigerator when he's on, when he's late to get to the UN. <laughs> you know, there's something that when you watch the film, you're going to see something that I didn't notice this the first time. You remember when when um, George Bush number one um, was asked how much a uh, a quart of milk cost, and he didn't really know because he I he, he had been shopping in years, and yeah. and all these things were done. 
uh, I think when you're a world leader of almost any country, the sort of normal things that you and I have to do, other people do for you. And so when I'm touring Fidel's kitchen, I say, Fidel, you got any beer? He opens up the freezer. And he realizes that maybe people don't keep beer in the freezer. They keep it down there. And then he found beer. And um, he actually, to be sociable, wanted to start drinking with me. And I had to say, Fidel, you've got the, one of the most important speeches of your life coming up. I don't think we should start drinking in the middle of the day. So he, he, I certainly reacted to him and treated him as if I would treat anybody the way I treated the peasants that I followed for 45 years, the way I treated the street hustler black marketeer that I followed for 45 years. And I think Fidel found it quite refreshing. I think that's, that's a, so, so I think that's another aspect of your style is that so I said I said before there's like two things that stand out, but there's actually many more. There's you have patience. Like I remember just my favorite from back in the day, which I mentioned to you before, was high on high on Crack Street. I don't know how long you follow those guys, but it was such a deep story over year, a period of years that it was it really was intense to to watch it. Well, I think time's a very important factor in the making of documentaries. Uh, not necessarily so in the evening news, but it is very, very important in documentary filmmaking. And you learn about people when you watch them subjected to the sort of vicissitudes of life. And uh, you need to keep your camera there day after day, week after week, year after year. In this particular case, decade after decade. Because I think the story of the Cuban Revolution can't be told in a snapshot. It, it needs to be looked at over time. And we were fortunate enough to be able to do that. I mean, I want to I want to dive into the specifics of the the topic, the Cuban Revolution, how you shot this movie. Um, there's another aspect too, I think, which is critical to your filmmaking, which works in a lot of these cases, which is that you're very bare bones. You'll like a lot of documentaries. There's going to be the three cameras and all the audio guys, and it kind of takes out the reality of what's happening. You just go right in there and, and like with a camera, go right up to someone's face and says, uh, hey, what would you do if you were mayor of New York, Fidel? And that also seems very unique to your style. I don't know many other documentary makers who, who do it quite like that for professional platforms. Like you've done 20, 30 documentaries for HBO. This one's for Netflix. Again, it's like you and maybe an audio person and you're in there. Um, I think certainly I come from a different background than most filmmakers. I never went to film school. I don't even know how many film schools there were when we first started using a camera. And since we were using video cameras and we were sort of seen as the antichrist in those days, basically because all the filmmakers looked down upon us, uh, we had to learn ourselves. My, my teacher was the sidewalks of New York. When we were showing our films in the very early days when we started, we showed them on the streets. And I bought an old mail truck for $5. It was, I think it was the best deal of my life. And somebody donated two big black and white TV sets to us. And we'd park the truck on a street corner in Chinatown. And we'd show our films. And the films were all about local subjects. But if the film, for whatever reason, wasn't interesting to the people that were passing by, they just kept on going to the, to the subway. And there's nothing like an empty sidewalk to really teach you whether your film is connecting with the audience or not. So so when you first were doing that, what did you what were some things that you learned specifically from that those experiments? Uh, a lot of the early video was very self-indulgent. Uh, they it, it, first of all it was hard to edit. Technologically it was almost impossible. And so these films were sort of droning, navel gazing, looking in a mirror that looks in a mirror that looks in a mirror that looks in a mirror, got video feedback that went on and on and on and on. If you would have shown that stuff on the streets, everybody would have walked away. If you were high as a kite and you were there with your buddies and watching, uh, you know, whoa, isn't this cool? Uh, but we were interested in video trying to, to, to catalyze social change. And so our early films were all about the problems in our neighborhood, the difficulties with housing, with health care, with the schools. And these were things that the people in the neighborhood cared about. And so it helped us relate to our fellow citizens. And these early films were really quite effective and wound up provoking specific changes and improvements in our community. And we'd been trying to do that basically as community organizers and had been failing. And when we saw the power of these cameras and the way in which media could move things in a positive direction, 
and it was sort of the first thing I'd ever succeeded in doing in my life. Uh, it was very exciting, very rewarding. And uh, what's a specific instance where um, video succeeded where your personal efforts did not? So uh, organizing taxi drivers, I was driving a taxi, impossible to organize taxi drivers because it's a workforce that competes against itself. So it's not like all the workers in a steel factory are angry at the boss and can fight against him. If you're driving a cab and somebody's raising their hand on the corner, you're going to cut me off in order to steal my fare. And so there's not, it's not that much solidarity within the workforce. And all our organizing attempts were absolute failures. And one day I made a short organizing film about all the things that re we really should be trying to correct. And it was like waving a magic wand over all the guys that watched it. And we began organizing in all the factories and taking over the factories and winning all the elections. It was exciting. Well, how did you how did you organize a story around that? that, that they can all, given that there was a, a conflict among all these guys, how did you uh, unify it into a story? So the film basically showed the fact that it was perhaps the most dangerous job in America at that time. They were killing a cab driver every three weeks in New York City. The cars were death traps. You step in the brake, the cars would spin around because they never repaired them. The wage system was one in which uh, they were creating two classes of workers and they were stealing our benefits. I mean, there were lots and lots of things that were going wrong. Uh, when we had union meetings, uh, they would send in goons and beat up anybody who tried to talk from the floor of the union meetings. And so I documented all this in a film. And everybody realized that they shouldn't be fighting against their fellow cab drivers, that the only way they were going to change these conditions would be to work together. And the documentary was very important in getting everybody to think that way. And I think a lot of your documentary documentaries also show this aspect of kind of social justice. There's this undercurrent of let's relate to a lot of people who are fighting for a cause and then show in kind of an extreme way how the you know what the ramifications are if we don't fight this condition so i mentioned just for the heck of it again high on crack street just because you almost need that title to get people to watch it on hbo at that time um but that's not what the show is about it's about hard conditions and and families going through difficult times and maybe how to persist and have resilience during these difficult times. And, and I feel that's a common thread as well. And I think it's also about the collapse of the economic system that sustained many people. The fact that the factories in all these industrial towns in New England f have fled and have left nothing in their wake and that drugs have moved in and basically lobotomized so so many people and destroyed their lives. It's a situation that was not only going on in Lowell, it was going on in my hometown, Port Chester, New York, in which every single factory that was humming away when I was in high school closed by the time I graduated. So so it's like it's it's like you're taking a personal story that's in some ways horrific and using it to tell a much broader uh maybe macroeconomic story or or social story or Whatever, but you always you always take it down to the personal, and I, I'm asking this not necessarily from the point of view of your technique, but also from the point of view of if anybody wants to make change, this is a method for doing it. Tell a personal story that's an example of a, a broader change you'd like to see happen, and and you do that in the in this Cuba and the cameraman as well. But I'm I'm interested in, in, on your opinion and just storytelling in general. Um, I think it's useful to have characters that people can like and can identify with and are willing to go along for the ride. And if you can form a bond between the people that are basically the stars of your documentary and the audience, people are going to watch. Um, I don't want to be the star of my film. I want the people who are in it to be the stars and I want you to be able to share their lives and then to start thinking about that. See, I was you know, basically a, a complete failure up until the moment that I started making films. I sort of had delusional dreams that I was going to be a hockey player. And uh, how many, do you know how many Jewish hockey players are in the NHL? There are a lot. Hall of Fame? I don't know about in the Hall of Fame, but there's a lot in the NHL. In the right NHL, now. but in the Hall of Fame, there's zero. 
Oh, that's 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 too bad. Uh, I think Corey Schneider, who's the goalie of the Devils, he's Jewish. Uh, last night, the guy Zucker from Minnesota scored a couple of goals. Um, I played hockey last night, and I scored a goal, and everybody stopped because that was such an unusual event. And and again, I've seen you play hockey. Yes, and so you you don't have the illusions that I had when I was a teenager <laughs> that I was good enough to be a hockey player. And that was really sort of beaten out of me uh, rather humi humiliatingly. And I sort of didn't know what I wanted to do. And I, I did believe what my parents taught me that you should try to make the world a better place would be what I would like to do. But my attempts at doing so weren't successful. We were fighting against the Vietnam War. We thought that was very, very important. The war went on. Uh, we'd be out in the streets battling the cops. I've got dents in my head from when the cops beat the daylights out of me. The cops beat me up. And um, the attempts to try and improve our community weren't succeeding. Camera in hand, everything changed. And also... I like people, but I think I'm naturally a shy person. And uh, I would have, like, if you were having a party here, or I'd sort of be uncomfortable in a corner and be looking for a way to get out of the room. But I sort of want to talk to everybody in this sort of this conflict. And, you know, I heard once that uh, a lot of the, the really good musicians, performers, and things like that are also shy people, but they overcompensate. And this is something that sort of energizes their performance. And the camera is a license for me to go up to you and to invade every single part of your life. Right, it does give permission to do whatever you want. And I like that. I'm a shy person, but I'm really curious. And I like people, and I like finding out about people who I don't know and uh, like telling their stories. And the camera is a license to invade people's personal space. And I do it to everybody sort of in equal measure. In this film, everybody gets their refrigerator opened and looked in, whether it's Fidel or whether it's my street hustler or whether it's a little girl who I met when she was seven years old. I don't think the peasants had a refrigerator. I would have looked in it if they did. So, so in you know, I think everybody works to their strengths. So, for instance, when Michael Moore makes a documentary, his strength is humor, mm -hmm. so he doesn't... You know, when somebody else makes a documentary, their their strength might be they'll insert themselves in every part of the documentary and kind of drive the story. I think where you recognized your strength, in addition to to saying having a philosophy of like, let's do this as simply as possible, so that not no technical there there should be no technical reason we can't document this story. But I think also your real strength is the patience. You're willing. You know, if you sit there for forty five years. <laughs> Nobody else is going to get this documentary. No one else is going to get the Cuba story, the Fidel Castro story, because no one else is going to simply sit there for 45 years and keep going back. And how many stories simultaneously were you doing at the same, you know, at the same time? So I actually have the 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 sort of um, saucepans simmering on a whole bunch of stories right now. We have a story about. Um, the the extermination of a Brazilian Indian tribe that I've been following for 25 years. Mm. Uh, there was a front page article in the New York Times that talked about the cult of suicide of the Guarani Indians in southwestern Brazil. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. The Indians were uh, removed from their, their, their natural places of living, put on a reservation, became miserable, uh, desolate, and to some degree hopeless and in sort of one last futile act were committing suicide more or less in protest against their conditions. So they were doing it at such an alarming rate that the tribe was going to put itself out of existence in five years. And I thought, well, it sounds like a good documentary to me. I'm going to go film this. I sent my friend to the reservation to see and she calls me. She goes, John, this is unbelievable. You have to get down here right away. But it's not suicide. It's homicide. And when you looked at the forensic photographs, the Indians were being hung from tree branches that were only like a foot off the ground. You can't hang yourself uh, a foot when you're sitting on the ground. Uh, and it was a land grab, and the white farmers were coming, knocking on the door and saying, James, uh, would you like to uh, sell me your land? No, I don't want to sell you my land. The next day, you would hang yourself. Mm. Uh, and so we've been following that story for a long, long time. Uh, How long? Oh, gosh, 23 years. So, cause it, so, so what do you feel when you, like the New York Times just did the article, it was wrong, so that's a, that's a quality there. And, and you go down there and you say to yourself, is it like you sort of, what do you feel like when you say, okay, I'm gonna devote 
25 years. Do you think it's going to be 25 years of your life that you're going to devote or you think you're going to try to get it all in one year? So the the only documentary that I've ever made fast, you know, I had to be fast when I was doing news for NBC. Um, I had to get there before all the other reporters. I had to film before the other reporters show up and I had to get back to New York and edit it. And, 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 and you covered all sorts of wars and, for them. And, you covered- and, and I got good at it. I didn't start out being good at it, but um, I was often too stupid to realize that where I was going was a little bit too dangerous and not smart to go. And I would go there and my reward was once I filmed these things, I could get the hell out and get back to New York. So I got to be really, really fast and um, better than all these other reporters. I would say in the 13 years that I worked with NBC, nobody ever beat me. I was, un- I was undefeated. Beat you in terms of? In, 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 unfortunately, in, in news reporting, getting there first, getting the story first, and getting it on the air first is the winner. Mm. And uh, quality has something to do with it, but it's not as important as who's first. And I was always first. Um, when I got blacklisted from NBC and all the other commercial networks, um, it was a bit of a crisis. Uh, Why'd you get blacklisted? Because I had film from Iraq that showed, it's actually, uh, it's an issue today. Uh, the New York Times has a piece about the civilian casualties and deaths in the current fighting in Iraq. Well, it was back in the first Gulf War. It was the same thing. The military was telling the American public that this was, to some degree, the first bloodless war. It was the war that was being run by computers in the airplanes, and they were precisely targeting all the missiles and the bombs, and there, nobody was getting hurt in the process. And I'd been to enough wars to know that this couldn't possibly be true. Managed to get myself into Iraq during the war, managed to defy all the restrictions of Saddam because it was it was re- it was weird because Saddam and the American government were telling the same lie different purposes uh, we were being sold something so that the war could be prosecuted and and maybe the American people wouldn't feel guilty and Saddam was pretending that he could stand up to the mighty United States and not get hurt and so he was also pretending oh, no damage here uh, and we were clobbering them and we were killing a lot of people and I, 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 I'm not saying, what I am saying is that's what war is about. And when the American people could be deluded into thinking that we can fight a bloodless war and nobody's going to suffer, I think that's not correct. And I think the, if we're going to go to war, we need to know the facts of what's happening and we weren't getting them. And I smuggled these tapes back out of the country into New York. Why do you say smuggle? Like was anybody- if They would have caught me, they would have killed me because I filmed these things because Saddam's trying to hide this stuff, okay? And the press restrictions were unbelievable. Uh, They're three pages single type of all the things you couldn't do. It seems like Saddam's being stupid in this situation in that if you can get, you know, support for the war was already kind of 50-50 in some cases or at different points of of the war. Uh, It seems like Saddam could have gotten um, help from the American people if the truth came out. So he changed courses uh, about a week or two after I left the country. And um, we had bombed a, um, an air raid shelter and killed a lot of people. And he decided at that particular point to try and exploit this and try to get the type of sympathy that you're talking about. But when we first arrived in the country, that was not his policy. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had the, the, we were shooting on a very small tape format called Hi-8. Uh, thank goodness they don't have high eight anymore. It wasn't uh, the only thing good about it was it was tiny, and we could sort of have a whole bunch of cameras, and it was like juggling, and or like it's more like three card monte. And the Iranian, the Iraqis never knew which camera was on. We had them so confused, and maybe it would be the camera under my armpit, uh, and we had a whole secret language of coughing and sneezing that uh, indicated who would do the distracting, who would do the filming. And so I'm, I'm trying to get these tapes out of the country. And I had four dummy tapes uh, that I labeled very important uh, and uh, must bring back to New York and had these tapes in my shirt pocket so that if somebody stopped me, I could, you want my tapes? And they were blanks. And I had the, the good tapes hidden in my sock. And we were leaving the country and we got intercepted. And this guy tried to kill me. He actually uh, put a gun to my head and he pulled the trigger for a good three or four minutes. Uh, luckily for me, the, the magazine jammed 
And the more he banged against this magazine, the more the gun jammed. And so he was, the, the gun was against your head. He's shooting the trigger. You're casually talking about it. Were you shitting in your pants of at course, the time? Of course. Like, did you actually course. shit though? No. No. Do you pee? No, uh, you know, I was I was certainly frightened, but it was like so surreal. Uh, I think if uh, somebody would have been standing there with a baseball bat, I might have been more scared because I sort of understand that and I've been hit on the head before. Nobody ever shot me. Uh, I have had people point guns at me and like like touch me in the head with guns and stuff like this. Uh, but my translator was like screaming back at him and 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 yelling, and I thought, well, maybe he'd talk him out of it. And then all of a sudden, my translator became silent. I said, Kaduri, what are you doing? Aren't you trying to save me? And he says, no, I told him to shoot you. I said, what? He said, yeah, I told him that uh, you were a very important person, that Saddam personally invited you into the country, and that if he kills you, Saddam's going to come and get him. Mm -hmm. And that didn't deter this guy. He really tried for another minute or two to try and shoot me, but his buddies listened to this, and then they realized that maybe the only reason why I would be in the country would be with Saddam's permission. And so eventually they pulled him off of me. But then they took us down to the police station, um, you know, the way they torture you in Iraq, well, they had lots of ways of torturing you, but one of their favorites is they beat you on the soles of your feet with a bamboo stick. And it doesn't leave any scars, but you can't walk for weeks. And it's really, really painful. And I'm in a room with about 16 men who don't like me. And there's one guy who really doesn't like me, and he's got a bamboo stick, and he's looking at me like this, and he's wrapping this thing into the palm of his hands, basically going, I'm going to get you, I'm going to get you. And I was more terrified because if they were, if he really was going to beat me, he was going to take off my shoes and socks and he was going to find those tapes. And then they really would think that I'm a spy and they just kill me on the spot. And so I'm trying to figure out how in the hell I'm going to keep this guy from, from, from like have, having a, a little bit of uh, good torture time with me. And luckily... We just kept stalling them off and stalling them off. Uh, and some guy checked with Baghdad and Baghdad said, no, no, this guy has actually been invited. You better let him go. Now, this was when you were there also on, like basically Ra Ramsey Clark was the conduit between Saddam Hussein and you at that, at that point, right? So Ramsey Clark got in the country. It was the fastest way for us to get in the country. And um, he was there doing his own personal investigation and I was sort of working alongside him uh, because this was the way we could get in the country and the way we could get around. They didn't let anybody drive around the country like we did. And we saw stuff that nobody could, nobody else could see. So, so w w the footage, you bring it back. Bring it back. Um, and everybody at NBC goes, oh my gosh, we didn't know this was going on. This is very, very important. And it's our duty as the reporters to put this on the air. This will be the lead story on Nightly News. And we're going to run it on the Today Show for you know, two or three days. And then a couple of hours before the broadcast, I get called into the president of NBC News and he looks at me and he says, you know, we're not going to broadcast this and you're not going to work here anymore. Get out, you're fired. Wow. Why, uh, why, the extre why not just say, we can't broadcast this? Why take the extra two steps? <laughs> uh, well, this guy was a hatchet man and um, he sort of relished doing this. Uh, I think that... The, the real serious reporters uh, at NBC were dismayed by this, uh, but they all ducked down and, and didn't say anything. And, and like, why wouldn't Tom Brokaw, who had some power there uh, at that time, uh, why wouldn't he, and you, you had worked with him for 13 years at that point, why wouldn't he intercede and say, hey, no, this is good stuff? I think this was a life or death, death issue for your career. And Tom had always been very supportive. Tom was on the board of directors of my community organization, did some very, very heavy lifting in order to help our community programs. Uh, I'll always be grateful and always consider him to be a friend. And he's coming to watch this film. If you guys want to come to the IFC feeder on the 28th of November, Tom's going to be there. I haven't seen him in a long time. And uh, he's not healthy. Uh, and I called and uh, said, I would really be honored if he would come and, and watch this last film, because this is sort of my life work and I want to share it with him. And a lot of the things that were going on in Cuba, we revealed for the first time on the Today Show with him. But everybody put their heads down. And so I'm, 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 I'm basically standing there in, in Rockefeller Plaza, feeling sorry for myself and licking my wounds, but thinking, well, you know, this is not about me. It's really about trying to get this story out and getting people to see it. And so 
I had had a very sort of bitter rivalry with CBS and I sort of bit my lip and I called up CBS and I said, listen guys, uh, you want to take a look at this tape? And they said, sure, bring it up, John. And so we watched this up at CBS and they said, this is amazing. How'd you get this footage? Uh, we're going to broadcast this and um, NBC, they're out of their minds and welcome to, to CBS. It's been a long time. I know we've been fighting with you. You've been scooping us, but uh, welcome aboard. Two o'clock in the morning, the president of, uh, of CBS News, who had made that decision, got fired. You don't fire people at two o'clock in the morning. If you ask me, like, who's pulling the puppet strings, I can't say, but it's ooh, something was going on, and everybody in broadcast news knew about it and wouldn't touch this with a 10-foot pole. And so the sort of smart people at NBC probably knew that there was something really, really strong and powerful behind this censorship. And that if they stood up uh, and, and stuck their head out of the trench, their head was going to get chopped off along with mine. Okay, so strong and powerful. There's, there's obviously a conspiracy theory you have here, which, which is not, might not be a conspiracy, might be real. It was, it's not a theory. Not a theory. So something bad happened at 2 in the morning to that CVS guy. Yes. NBC got the call from above. What is the theory? What's the fact? What, what are you actually saying? Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Every podcast I do is so personal and special to me. So help people discover this podcast. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts. You can also check out the show notes at jamesaltucher.com slash podcast. And also, if you want to get my blog updates and other updates that I do, Sign up for the newsletter at jamesaltucher.com. Once again, thanks so much for joining me on the journey of this podcast. What is the theory? What's the fact? What, what are you actually saying? Well, listen, governments have their own agenda. They have interests to pursue, and we're naive to think that they're not going to assert force in some form or other in order to realize their objectives. On the other hand, the news media is supposed to be an important counterforce to, to the government. And we're supposed to be the eyes, the ears, and to some degree the truth tellers so that we don't get duped into thinking there are bloodless wars or who knows what else the government is trying to sell us. And there's always going to be friction between these two things because we have different jobs to do. Um, I don't think that's an unnatural situation. And... In the United States, they're not supposed to kill reporters, and in general, they don't. Uh, they're not supposed to put us in jail, and in general, they don't. If I was a reporter in any other country, I'd be dead 100 times uh, for doing the things that I do. So um, it's one of the things I love about my country. And I also think that, I don't know how you define patriotism, but I want to make this country better. And um, I'm not a good soldier, so I can't go and fight for the country. Um, I'm not a politician. I can't go represent them in Congress. But I can be a good reporter. And I can point out the things, and I can make films about the things that I think need to be improved and need to be better. I'm not doing this because I don't like the country. I'm doing it because I love my country. And that's uh, how I believe I can be the best patriot. So, so... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the segue into the uh, Cuba and the cameraman. You get there in 1972. You call it throughout the movie, the revolution. The revolution happened in 1959. You're there in 1972 in, in, in some sense to see how it's going. You, you, make some ca you make a comparison between what happened in Cuba with what was potentially happening or, or, or what you were doing on the streets of New York, which you referred to earlier. And that's kind of how the movie starts. And you get deeper and deeper into... The, the lives of these families, plus Castro himself. Do you feel you got, and, and look, there are so many great parts of the movie, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna play almost the devil's advocate. Be my guest. Do, do, you, do you feel you got too involved in the story of the revolution as opposed to the story of what's happening in Cuba, which I know there might not be a difference. It's like a, it's like a nuance of words. Um, I, I, don't quite under, understand the here that you're splitting at this particular point. What I do want to say is that the things that we observed and the things that we put in the film are sometimes joyful, but sometimes they're really painful. And 
the my friends and the main characters in this movie suffer a lot. They especially suffer uh, in the 90s when every single bit of air goes out of the Cuban balloon. The um, United States crashed the sugar price in order to destroy the Cuban economy. We did a fantastic job doing it. We dumped our sugar reserves on the open market and destroyed the sugar price, which was the basic foundation of their their economy. Also, uh, Russia, Russia, the Soviet Union subsidies. collapsed, pulled eight million dollars. So the the gross national product of Cuba contracted eighty five percent. So you can imagine on you you you, you let's let's say you you make fifty thousand dollars a year. Um, I'm not good at math, but basically you'd be left with five thousand dollars a year to 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 survive on. And the things that happened to my friends, nobody's ever filmed anything like this. The Cubans never filmed anything like this. This was nothing that they ever talked about in state media. It's the same so, type of thing as the Iraq thing. They had they wanted to show that despite everything, Castro was still. Uh, able to hold things together, and and the, the the Cuba, you know, social philosophy was was working despite all these troubles. So um, I I'm going to certainly say that I was predisposed mm -hmm. to like the things that the Cuban Revolution was doing. I was predisposed to like universal free education. I'm predisposed to like universal free healthcare. I'm predisposed to like affordable housing for everybody. It's the things we need here in the United States, and they were doing it. Uh, and so it was exciting in the early years of the revolution to watch somebody actually swinging for the fences. But 20 years later, 30 years later, um, the, the, certainly the economic progress um, slowed to a crawl and actually regressed. And uh, we don't shy away from showing that in the film. No, but what I'm wondering is, yes, they had uh, universal education, universal health care, but a lot of that also was subsidized by Russia wanting to essentially have an outpost, you know, 44 minutes off of Florida. Mm -hmm. And so just on their own, do you think they would have been able to, to do it? I mean, and the other way to ask this is Russia themselves couldn't do it forever. Russia collapsed. Correct. And so I'm wondering philosophically if you saw this is a little bit of a facade what's happening. That, that's, it's it's, a, it's a, a nationwide welfare system in some sense. So I think the tragedy is that we'll never know what would have happened if everybody would have sort of kept their fingers off the scale because they were never free from the sort of destruction that the United States was was imposing upon them. Uh, we We blockaded them in a way that hurt the sort of natural direction of their economy. Um, we probably introduced swine fever into the country that wiped out uh, most of the pigs. We probably introduced something called El Mol Sazul, the, the blue fungus that destroyed their tobacco crop. Um, we tried to kill Fidel hundreds of times, put him into a defensive and sort of stubborn posture that left him sort of unable to improvise and do the things that he needed to do because he was so busy trying to keep himself alive and to keep the revolution alive under the relentless pressure from the United States would, would have been more interesting, would have been, I think, beneficial to the world, would have been, well, you know, they want to do this. Why don't we take a step back and let them be the laboratory for this type of grandiose, supposedly idealistic experiment? Let's see whether it works or not. And we had been using Cuba as a testing ground for all sorts of things. We tested, for example, it sounds inane, but color television down in Cuba. The initial color vision technology, the broadcast of color television, uh, some innovations in the telephonic system and things like that. We used Cuba, had a small contained population, easily studied, and they were a lab rat for us. It would have been great to, to let them try this social experiment and then 45, 50 years later, like we're doing now, say, well, Sure, it didn't work. This didn't work. But that worked. Maybe we could apply that here in the United States, and we didn't. And I think that's what's great about the documentary is, again, you look at it not through the lens of like, oh, we're going to be political analysts, but through the stories of these families. So you see their their rise and fall and rise and fall. It's very uh, uh, amazing footage. You have the, the tiny girl. I forget what her name is. She was six years old. And then you go back, you know, 16 years later, to find out and to track her down and find out where she is. She had given all she had given you in that initial footage was her address. And uh and then you go to that address, like, oh, her brother's upstairs, but she's at this one building. You go to the building, you see her, how she grows up, you play baseball with her kids. Uh it's that kind of footage which 
I think again makes these types of documentary or or your types of documentaries win because who has the patience? Uh, every I feel like in many cases somebody would just say, okay, we're going to take archival footage, we're going to document some historical thing and make a a point as opposed to tell a story. So they could, and there are people who are sort of intellectually. Uh, wider and deeper than I am, who would be able to make a sophisticated political or economic analysis of Cuba. I can't do that. I'm not capable of doing that. But you don't uh, need to because you got the stories. But So I'm doing this in a different way. I'm trying to do this in a very basic um, human way in which I'm letting the the people live their lives and observing these lives. And there's something in there that I think is just as important as every deep voice narrated report that's ever been done. And since I can't do that, and you're you're listening to me, I don't have a deep voice, and I don't uh, look handsome like the other correspondents, and I don't have safari suits. I'm sort of a nice, regular guy. People well, relate to me, and this, you know, Fidel relates to me. He's, there hasn't been anybody who's walked in his door who's like this kid from New York. He hasn't seen that type of person before, and um, and people also, when you meet people, they size you up right away, and they're going to look in your eyes, and they're going to decide. Can I trust this person to share these really intimate details of my life? And if they believe that you're sincere and that you like them, uh, they trust you and they let you do it. So this is often the task of the documentary maker. I feel like whether it's sincere or insincere, you have to figure out how to make yourself likable to the subject. Absolutely. You're trying to break through personal space. Everybody has their own defenses around them. You can't sit down on the subway and start up a conversation here in New York City. We just don't do it. If you have a camera, you have a license to start talking to that person. Um, there are very good, uh, you know, I, I, sometimes I name names, but today I don't feel like it, but we can. you, you can imagine some famous interviewers who emote sincerity, emote interest. They're looking in your eyes. Uh, Bill Clinton does this when you when you interview him uh, and when you talk to him. He folds his hands under his chin and stares at you like this and nods and tries to make you think that you are the only person in the world. And he goes through this routine in which his aides begin coming in the room and tapping, whispering, Bill, the Queen of England is upstairs. We've got to go. And he's, no, 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 this is much more important. I have to talk to James. I have to talk to James. And he looks at you, go on, James, and, and nodding. And they would come, Jim, uh, it, yeah, sorry, you can't talk to Jim anymore. Yeah, um, um, the, the, the leader of the Senate is upstairs waiting for you. And there's an ambassador. Sorry, no, no, I have to finish this with James. And he would go through this a couple of times. Um, you ever see James Brown? Uh, no, no. James Brown had this great end to his act in which um, he would finish his last song and he would collapse on the floor in exhaustion after giving you every bit of his emotion, like Bill Clinton is giving you every bit of his attention. And his um, his aide would drape a, a, a cloak across James Brown, start dragging him across the stage, and he'd throw the coat off and come back and sing some more for you and do this again, and then collapse, and they'd drag him off the stage. This would go on two or three times. And so Bill Clinton, finally, the third or fourth time they tapped him on the shoulder, would say, listen, I'm really sorry. I want to stay here and talk at you. You're the most important person in the world to me, but I got to go. And and you think, wow, isn't that great? But it's an act. I'm sorry, it's an act. And 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 one of the things as um, as directors, especially documentary directors, we have to know when something feels true and when it doesn't feel true. Uh, it goes for fictional films, it goes for documentaries, and we're really oversensitized to that. And Bill Clinton was a good actor. I'm not sure he was a great actor. What I'm trying to say is that I really do like the people who are in my film. I remain loyal to them over the years as a friend. Uh, as soon as I went back to Cuba, no matter what was going on in the country, I was knocking on their door and trying to find out what was going on, sharing things with my life. My family traveled with me. They all knew my daughter. They watched her grow up. And you know, the third or fourth, they, they, you know, Juanito is really sincere. He really is my buddy. Uh, and these people were the strongest and amongst the best friends uh, in my entire life. And the ones that are still alive remain so today. And so, so with Fidel also, though, I'm sure everybody's trying to catch his attention. You just shout out like questions and he's drawn to you. How do you think that, what do you think was the, the charisma there? Like, what, how do you think you kind of, I don't want to like drew him in sounds manipulative, but you essentially established some kind of bond, a strong enough bond that the the name of the documentary is Cuba and the cameraman. Yeah, I think that um, 
again, what I'd like to say is that I didn't relate to him the way the other reporters and the other correspondents would. Fidel, um, I want you to comment upon the economic failures in the sugar crop. Uh, or, uh, Fidel, you've been accused of uh, fomenting communist revolution in these different places. Those are important questions. Uh, again, I'm sort of not that type of guy. And I want to be able to share something about Fidel that nobody else has ever done. Um, like what was your intent? Well, what, what, before you shared anything with him. Who is him? this guy? And like, what type of person is he? What makes him tick? How could we get uh, sort of behind the green army suit and find out what type of man is inside it? That was my intention. And you feel you, I mean, clearly you succeeded in many ways. Did you, did you succeed to the extent that you wanted to? Or greater than? Uh, I, I think I've done as good as anybody's ever been able to do. Um, there have been a couple of good films about Fidel. Saul Landau, uh, an American documentary filmmaker who lived for many years in Cuba, did two really good films about Fidel. I don't know, I, I, but I think that there's a side to him that is revealed in my film that uh, nobody's ever shown. Um, and the Cubans all say that uh, they've never seen anything like this, and it's very, very important to them because Fidel was the most important person in their life. Uh, he shaped their life, whether for good or for bad, and the fact that they knew more about him through our film makes our film very, very valuable in Cuba. I mean, I think it's a very powerful film. It's a very valuable film because we see this important... I mean, Cuba was this kind of nexus point in between U.S. politics and, and Soviet politics. And again, you capture this personal side of it through both your skills as a storyteller... And again, your your patience as a storyteller is forty five years of mm -hmm. of going back and forth. Uh, you, let, me, let me ask you this: Why, when you when you were packaging packaging it up and making it into its final form, and you mentioned before this is you told Tom Brokaw this is the the work of your life. Uh, how did you decide where to put it? Like who? What was what was kind of what's what's sort of the after story in terms of like okay, you have this documentary. Who's asking for it? Why are they asking for it? Why did you make your decision to put it on Netflix? Um, um, I'll tell you a couple of things. First of all, um, I had to show the film in a sort of very rough and tumble sample form to Netflix. And you know, I, I'd never worked with them before. I'd basically been mono monogamously married to HBO for 30 years. And... I confess that um, I, I uh, told Sheila about this film at HBO and uh, wondered if she wanted it, and she rejected it, and rejected it, and rejected it. From you, has she ever rejected a show from you? Of course she has, of course. <laughs> She's rejected shows from me before. Uh, but I, I was to some degree heartbroken because um, I, I had so much of my heart and soul uh, in, in this film and had been sort of vacuuming the nickels and dimes out of the couch in order to keep this thing going uh, when there was no support for this. And I was lucky enough to show this to Netflix, at which point Netflix said, we, we are really intrigued by this film and we want to give you the support and whatever support you need in order to realize your artistic vision. We're here to support you. And I had never had anybody say that to me before. Uh, and I said, really? And they said, yep. And and I thought, well, it's probably, it, from this particular point, not gonna be so hard to make. It was really hard. Uh, I had uh, over a thousand hours worth of footage, a lot of it from tapes that had deteriorated and had to be restored. We had missing tapes and we hunted some of them down, some of them we never found. And I still mourn the fact that there's some material that would have improved this film, especially in the early years that we weren't able to include. But hours and hours and hours in the editing room and boiling the sauce down again and boiling the sauce down again and moving this scene around in order to try and make it uh, fit better in the program. So it was, it, was, um, it was a tough editing process. It really was. I had a great editing team. Uh, Dave Manessis was the lead editor. And we finally finished it. How long, how long did it take to edit 1,000 hours of footage? It took a year. It took a year. I hate being in the editing room. I mean, you know me. I like being on the street and I like talking to people. I can't stand sitting down in the editing room. It just drives me nuts. Oh, I, there's a certain poetry to kind of moving the scenes around and figuring out the right story I mean, to, if, to pull if you out of them. If you have a, a normal attention span, but if you have my type of attention span and you're sort of hyperactive, I, it, it's tough. 
Uh, luckily, you know, I'm getting older, and so I'm slowing down a little bit. I can actually sit in the editing room more. I used to drive my editors nuts. I had exercise machines in the editing room. I had my trumpet in the editing room. I had an electric piano, and then they're trying to edit, and I'm beep, 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 beep in the background because I just couldn't sit there. But this one, we sat through all this stuff. Uh, it, We had the good fortune uh, to have it premiere at the Venice Film Festival. I haven't participated in many film festivals. Uh, normally, we just make the, f- the film, boom, put it on the air, and that was enough for us. But Netflix submitted it to Venice, and they accepted it. But we had to translate it into Italian. And Netflix said, oh, we'll take care of that. And I said, good, when you get the subtitles on it, I want to see it. And they said, well, nobody has asked that before. I said, well, I want to see it. So um, they sent it to me, and they ruined it. They just covered the thing with every single syllable that was said was um and ahs. You hear the way I'm talking right now. They they translated that. Uh, you you basically spent the whole time reading the film instead of watching it. And I said, I'm not going to send this to Venice. And they said, Why not? I said, Because uh, we have to really condense these subtitles. Just just express the minimum there so that people understand what's going on, but let them feel it, not let them read it. And they said, Well, you're on your own, buddy. Uh, how, how are you going to do it? And I said, Well, you know, I used to play for this Italian uh, semi pro soccer team. And I called up Pepe, my buddy from high school, and I said, Pepe, you got to come help me. And he drove in from um, upstate. And we spent, we crashed it over the weekend. Uh, we also had an editor who had had uh, a semester of high school Italian. And between Pepe, the editor, and Google Translate, we redid all the subs. And show up in Italy. This is a gorgeous theater. Uh, it seats, I don't know, there were like 900 people in the theater. This huge balcony, beautiful sight lines, great projecting, beautiful audio. And I'm sitting there. Uh, in the sort of middle seats. They call it the queen's booth, uh, where the queen used to sit. I don't know which queen it was, but there was some queen it's, uh, when they first built this theater. And they're playing this film, and all the Netflix executives are besides me. And the first joke comes, and nobody laughs. And I go, uh-oh. The, we, I guess we didn't do such a good job translating. I shouldn't have complained. I should have just put the Netflix version up. And But the next time they were supposed to laugh, they laughed. And pretty soon they seemed to be reacting the way you hope that they're going to react uh, when you make the film. But an hour and 50 minutes later, and that's how long the film is, folks. If you're going to watch it on Netflix, you have to be able to sit there for almost two hours. The, the film ends. Screen goes black. And there's complete silence in the theater. And the cold sweat starts pouring down the back of my neck. And I'm going, fooey, blew it. And we've bombed. And I've got these Netflix people next to me. I'm never going to make another Netflix film. And it was humiliating. And all of a sudden, the entire body of the theater, 900 people, they start screaming and cheering and calling my name and whistling and... They wouldn't stop. It was like I hit a walk-off home run. Now, nobody had ever cheered for me before. And the tears are like pouring. I don't want the Netflix people to see me crying, but the tears are pouring down my face because it was a 45-year gestation period for this movie, and it was the first time anybody had seen it. And I just wept like a baby. So I'm not going to be able to... You, you won't see my reaction when you watch this on, on Netflix, but I really am curious to find out people's reaction to this and to sort of get feedback. I, I don't really participate in social media, but um, you can email me at johnny, J-O-N-N-Y, at dctvny.org, and uh, let me know what you think. And uh, uh, obviously it'll be on Netflix. Will you... Will you- show it anywhere or I don't I guess once it's on Netflix you don't really show it in theaters or anything um let's see so there's going to be a couple of interesting theatrical presentations it's going to be in Trento Italy the Italians really like this movie and the press in Italy was like stupefyingly nice uh I'd like to be able to go but I don't think I can uh we're going to show it in Moscow and um, I've been doing a lot of things in Moscow because I've been chasing after Putin, and I'm starting to get really close. And um, this is another 25 year. Uh, you know, I, I, I've actually challenged him to meet me on the ice, 
and uh, he's evidently considering it. So that'll be interesting. Uh, and we're going to show the movie in Havana at the Havana Film Festival on December 13th, which is my birthday. And um, we're taking a whole bunch of people from DCTV down to watch the movie. So that's probably going to be the end of its theatrical presentations. But Netflix, what's really nice is the film lives forever. And it'll live forever in hundreds of countries. It'll live forever in over 100 languages. And anytime anybody wants to watch the movie in Bulgaria or Botswana, they can watch it. Well, uh, John, John Alpert, Cuba, and the, and the cameraman, I've seen it. And I also have to tell you, just the short amount of time, the few years we worked together back in the 90s, I learned so much from you about storytelling. Well, I'll just tell you real briefly what they were. You said to me, no talking heads. <laughs> <laughs> always have action. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very important role in storytelling, particularly documentary storytelling, which I think started off as a talking head medium. And uh, I also learned from you, be as efficient as possible. Don't have the full array of cameras that you can have, just use what you need. So that's how you get more personally into someone's story. Not be afraid to ask an offbeat que question. You almost want to, um, you almost want to see what you can get. You ask the question to get in the door, and then you see what else you can get once you're in the door. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's there, there were many other things, but you were you were definitely uh, fearless in the project we worked on together, and it looked like you were incredibly fearless in this project. So I. I Highly recommend it. I highly recommend people see it. And and thank you for coming on the, the well, podcast. Well, thank you. You had all the good ideas on that particular project. And um, no, no, but you, the way you would execute on them, you would you would like when we were doing the um, East Side, you would go to one group, see what their temperature was at, then you'd go to another group, and then you'd see if there was a fight maybe developing. Did, like you knew how also, to. Didn't we also do the first internet porn for that? Oh yeah, we yeah, did? right. I forgot about that. Oh, we totally did. It was the first porn <laughs> site ever. We went up there, and uh, Vanessa <laughs> Del Rio was uh, was up there as well. And uh, but this was this was this was buried in an industrial building over by NYU, and the the feat the feature um, uh, performer was a transgender Peruvian who would be doing sort of the equivalent of a podcast, a video cast that was interactive. And if they could succeed in getting your, your credit card number and keep you on the line, it was like, like running the taxi meter. And I remember you being impressed because you had a, a knowledge of uh, computers and the infrastructure, and you had been involved in, in sort of some pioneer work in that particular area. But when we looked at the technical support that these guys had it was far more sophisticated than anything you had seen before yeah. and we were just astonished that these porn meisters were at the forefront of the sort of technological revolution yeah and back I wanted, in like 97 and, and i can't remember uh why i was doing this but a, a, a number of years later um i was in a townhouse and i was filming something in the townhouse with some guy and um he i said well what do you do and, and how were you able to buy this fancy townhouse? And he goes, oh, I'm in the porn business. And it was the guy that, the same guy. And he, crazy. Had, he, he had made so much money. He had this fancy townhouse uh, up in the Upper East Side. And when we went upstairs, it was the same cast of characters who were still doing these, uh, these interactive podcasts. It was, it was pretty funny. That's hilarious. I didn't know that. So you'll be able to get me. You'll be able to get me footage of uh, the the old three AM stuff. I have the footage of the old three AM stuff, and um, I, I think I think you really enjoy it. And uh, you'll probably, if you put it out, uh, somebody will think that this is that somebody will finally appreciate the idea. Yeah, <laughs> and you'll be able to get other people to watch it. Um, if I could have some parting words for you kids, um, if there is a secret formula to doing what we do it's it's this and i'm gonna i'm gonna use a sound effect i'm tapping and so when when you're wondering like what you need to do to try to make a good documentary you need time time's a very very important variable you need access so you if you're not doing something unique that that any if you're doing something anybody else can why they're going to watch your film so you need access to something that's unusual we certainly had it in this cuban documentary how do you get access in general 
you, you work at it and um, you, you, you are sincere. You communicate honestly with the people that you're working with so that they understand that you're not there to exploit them, but you're there to work with them and to tell their story. That's one way. Sometimes you get access by going places that everybody else is scared to go. Um, there's lots of ways to get access, but you need to have time. You need access and those things are hard. And so you're asking, how do you get it? It's you got to work at it, and uh, you have to walk through the fire. You got to duck the bullets. You got to swim through rivers full of shit. You got to eat things that are going to make you sick. And if you don't have something burning inside you, you can't do it. So you have to have passion. So TAP, you need time, access, and passion. If you have those things, you're going to make a good show. All right. Well, John, once again, thanks for coming on the podcast. Anybody who wants to subscribe to this podcast, go to iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you watch this podcast and subscribe to the James Altucher, Altucher show. I can't even say my own last How name. How much does it cost? Uh, zero. It's free. That's unbelievable. Yeah. You know, what better deal is that and what better way to celebrate any holiday than to get something free like this? And to watch Cuba and the Cameraman Thank on you. Netflix. That'll cost you uh, either, I think it's $9.99 for the, uh, for the silver plan and $12.99 for the platinum. But with the platinum, I think you're allowed to like five people sign up for free. Oh, really? Yeah. And so you can split it and basically it'll cost you $2 a month each. And, and you're not going to just, once you're on Netflix, it's like there's plenty of things to watch. So I, I, I guess so. And then, you know, we all want to cut these cords and maybe that'll be your first step in doing so. This is, my New Year's resolution this year is I'm cutting the cords, and uh, what goodbye, does that mean? goodbye Directv, goodbye. Uh, uh, what's our? What Spectrum is our new cable company now that took over from Time Warner. You can't imagine the size of the bill we get from these guys. And when you take your eye off the bill for a second, and they're they're adding another ten dollars a month to it. And you know, there's a workaround to all these things. I I really only watch two or three things. I'm watching the hockey games uh, and the soccer games, and I don't watch anything else. And so why am I paying for all this other type of stuff? I don't want to see Geraldo. I want to see Manchester United. Well, once again, <laughs> John Alpert, thanks for coming on the podcast. Okay, great. All right, thanks a lot, man. All right, thanks. Nice seeing you again. Yeah, it was, uh, it was great documentary. You did such a good job. You really feel this is your your the work of your life? Next time on The James Altucher Show. We do things, we create because it, it's in us, but actually, again, by virtue of the fact that we're social beings and, and, and our identity is bound up in what we create, then that identity needs to be confirmed by others, right? So it's it's interesting thing, identity. It's, you know, it's simultaneously what makes us different, but it's also what binds us together with a group. And I think the interesting thing is that years ago, you'd have a much smaller group or, you know, to kind of right. validating that. Now, you have people out there, James, that don't have a vested interest in you feeling good about yourself. Actually, there's people out there that would find it interesting if you didn't. And you've got to ask yourself, do I give them? Like, is the source not important? I kind of think of, of all these sort of message boards, whatever you want to call them, the comments. It's like a big bathroom door, right? It's a big old filthy bathroom door that anyone can kind of take out their pen and have at it. And you're going to have sort of thoughtful responses sometimes on bathroom doors, I get. But you're going to have a lot of stuff that, that's because I'm having a bad day. Why should you have a good one, right? So I think there's, there's something really important about the source and who's giving you that validation and maybe kind of exploring... If it's if it's quality or quantity, and maybe you know that's that's what we've kind of sold our souls for quantity. So there there is something I think about taking away some of that power from the other, right? And how do you do that? AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com advance.
That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.